Hello everyone and welcome back to another brand new episode of Collider Mailbag. My name is Dennis, I'm here with Perry. And we're here to take your viewer submitted questions. How do you do that? You email us at collidervideo at gmail.com. We'll answer on today's mailbag show, tomorrow's mailbag show, and our daily movie talk show. Uh, Perry, how's it going? It, t today is a special day. I'm really excited for today. For first things first is that I have to rush out of this office and, and get ready because yes. we got a big event tonight. What is that event? Yeah, we're going to go watch Star why, Wars. I don't know why I'm the afraid last to Jedi. say it. Every single time I someone am, brings it up, I'm like, it's this secret thing that's not so secret. I'm really freaking excited yeah. to be going to Star Wars The Last Jedi premiere tonight. Yes, uh, we went to the Rogue One last year, and then this year we were fortunate enough. And it was one of my favorite nights of the whole year. I had yeah. so much fun. And this year we were fortunate enough to go to this one. And we're closing it out again this year, me and Mark Ellis, yes, right? Yes, yes. We're, we're not leaving until we are the last ones left in that building. I will just see to it. So um, we'll, we'll have more on that on uh, next week's Movie Talk and Mailbag and, and all that stuff. But let's get on to the first question. The first question comes to us from All Out Movies, and uh, he or she writes, Hey Collider, it's rare for Oscars to ever nominate a horror, sci-fi, or comic book movie. That being said, what do you think has a better shot for a nomination? Get Out, Blade Runner 2049, or Logan? If we are talking best picture, hands down Get Out. I actually think it has a really good shot at getting it. I think at this point, I would almost be surprised if it didn't get mm -hmm. a best picture nomination, especially given how well the movie's doing with, with guilds, with critics organizations, with things like the Gotham Awards where Get Out was recognized. I definitely think it has a shot at that, and I also think it has a really good shot at getting a best uh, original screenplay nomination mm -hmm. too. And I would just really love to see that happen. Where I think Blade Runner is gonna come into the equation is with the technical awards. I do think that it has a very good shot at getting a cinematography award very good shot at getting a production design nomination very good shot at getting VFX as well but what I want to see happen with the VFX category is I want War for the Planet of the Apes to get the nomination which I think it will but I want it to get the win mm. really I just can't shake the thought that none of the Planet of the Apes movies the newer <laughs> ones have ever won that VFX award that is just insane to me and it drives me crazy so I want it to be that movie's the that movie's a year this year mm -hmm. in that category. Uh, sadly, I don't think Logan mm -hmm. is going to pop up. I think it might be, uh, you know, kind of what we were talking about with Deadpool last year, where we were talking about the possibility, but it just never happens. Mm -hmm. But you know, Logan uh, got a nomination at the Critics' Choice Awards. Mm -hmm. uh, Patrick Stewart is nominated in the Best Supporting Actor category, so happy that happened. Yeah, I I'm similar with you. Even though I love Logan, I think it deserves an Oscar nomination. I just. It, the chances are much smaller mm -hmm. than Get Out. I think Get Out has been much more well received, especially on the top critics lists uh, at the end of the year. So I think, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Get Out doesn't get one, but I think it has a, a good shot at where Logan is a, a much smaller chance. And then mm -hmm. I think, we're, I'm just talking about best picture here. Blade Runner 2049, I, I think, has even tinier chance of getting a best picture. Yeah. It just, even though it was well received by critics, it wasn't well received by the audiences um, in terms of box office and just people aren't really talking about. It. Yes, it, Roger Deakins will get a, a nomination for cinematography, some of the technical aspects, but but I, I just don't see it getting a best picture one. Logan. Yes, you could get, Patrick Stewart might get uh, Best Supporting. That'd be a, a small chance at that. That uh, is a stacked field, yes. though. Yes. So those are things that I I hope Logan gets for, but I just don't see it happening. Logan is still up there on my personal list, yes. though, because we're getting close to doing our top fives for the channel, and it's it, it's so frustrating, but it's such a great thing that there's so many movies this year. I think there's more movies on my potential top 10 oh, list really? this year than in previous years where there's certain ones that it's heartbreaking to, you know, draw the line mm. somewhere and cut them off. Yeah, so uh, Get Out, good chance. Yeah. Logan, small chance. I, I, think, I think Blade Runner is like If we're ranking chances chance. for best picture, I would say Get Out is the most likely, but then I would put Blade Runner over Logan. Really? Yeah. I, I, I'm not I saying that's what I want even, but I'm just, you know, try, like prediction wise, if I was betting on these, I would bet Get Out, but then I would bet Blade Runner and then Logan. Yeah, I just, I haven't seen Blade Runner 2049 talked about that much lately. 
in, 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 in the end of the year lists? Other than technical achievements. I haven't really either, but you know, when we're talking about just talk and buzz, yes. technical achievement does give it a little bit of a boost, whereas, you know, Logan is just, any kind of buzz with awards is focused on particular I think less, with Logan, less, the, the acting has is, is been most talked about, I think. I think most, most of what I've heard has been Patrick Stewart. Yeah. All right. Next question, we have Paul McGregor, and he writes, Hey, guys, Paul McGregor from Dublin, Iron. Uh, are you related to Conor McGregor from, MN, from UFC? I was just wondering, with the success of Wonder Woman, we saw her take a more prominent leading role in Justice League and even, ha even had to do more reshoots to achieve this. So with the success of Thor Ragnarok, maybe a year ago Marvel might have been thinking of killing Thor off in the upcoming Avengers movies. Do you think this success might change things if this is the case? Cheers guys, and The Punisher is the best thing I've seen all year. <laughs> Merry Xmas. Um, I think the two franchises are in completely different places, whereas DC and Warner Brothers might have been looking at the response to Wonder Woman, trying mm -hmm. to get a cue of for what to do next. I think Marvel is a little more planned out ahead of time. It's, in my mind at least, I don't really know what their thought process was, but what I think is that they had, they had things like Avengers Infinity War and Avengers 4 planned out a certain way no matter how Ragnarok performs. So mm -hmm. I don't think you could really make the same comparison, but at the same time, I also do think that the folks at the helm of all these Marvel movies, Feige and everybody else, mm -hmm. I do think they pay attention to fan feedback. I forget, oh, it was, it was Stranger Things. It was when I did that video about Stranger Things and what we know thus far. Mm -hmm. One of the quotes that we covered in that piece was that they, they do respond to what we as viewers and fans have responded to and they think about that when they're developing new storylines and new seasons and mm. I really think the same is true for any franchise out there really or it should be true because it's a smart move to make but I don't think we're going to see oh because Thor Ragnarok was so well received we're not going to do tons of reshoots to keep Thor from dying if that e is even the plan which I don't think so but I, I don't think you can compare the two in that way. Yeah, I don't think Thor was ever going to die just because it's one of the the title franchise characters. I think if if a character dies, and I think there will be a death or deaths in yeah. Infinity War, it's going to be a Hawkeye, a Scarlet Witch, a Vision, someone that doesn't have their own yeah, franchise, right? Not an Iron Man, not a Captain America, not a Thor, not a even Hulk is too big. For you know what I mean? It has to be someone where like. Look, I like Hawkeye, but if Hawkeye disappears from Avengers, he will be missed, but he won't be, you know what I mean? He won't be an integral yeah. part. Because now you're th talking about Avengers Infinity War, there's so many characters. You're watching that trailer, and yes, we, we kind of pick out like, oh, we didn't see this person or this person. But when you think about it, like, there's so much going on in there that I, I think that, that it's one of those characters that will eventually uh, kick the bucket. I'm still sticking with my predictions, though. I do think that Hawkeye is going to be the one to go in Infinity War because they, they highlighted Linda Carlini's character in the photos. We've only seen her once for a little bit. Mm -hmm. I just feel like that's, you know, setting the stage for, oh, be sad because Hawkeye's going to die and he's going to leave her. But then also in Avengers 4, I do think one of the big ones are going, and I'm still betting on Cap for that. Yeah, and I'm also with you in the fact that with Kevin Feige and the, and the MCU, it's they plan out things a lot better. I mean, one of my complaints, you know, when we were talking about Star Wars was when they were talking about the, the future of the trilogy movies, I'm like, how do you guys not have some of that stuff planned out already? You know, like episode nine and whatnot. Like, I, I thought that was a little weird where, you know, with Marvel, they've got yeah. years and years and years planned out. Well, that is basically what Feige said in recent quotes, something like 20, 20 movies in the works right now. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys, and uh, we'll move on to the next question. A Alex Carrillo writes, Hey, Collider crew. Hi, Ashley. <laughs> uh, so I was watching Airplane 1980, and the rating is PG, but in the, freak, in the freak out, there's a brief nudity scene, which I don't mind. My question is, is was the ratings much more tolerable back then? The rating system was definitely different, and the one that sticks out in my mind more so than anything is that Poltergeist was rated PG. Mm -hmm. That is crazy to me, especially because that is one movie that I watched very young, and 
even though I, like, I wasn't scarred for life or anything, but that movie scared me when mm -hmm. I was a kid. It doesn't really anymore, but you have movies like Poltergeist, there's Jaws, Beetlejuice, Gremlins. There, there are movies that I think would nowadays warrant the PG-13 mm -hmm. rating, but I think they gave out that PG rate rating a little more easily than they do today. Yeah, I, it's definitely different. I think nudity is something they tol tolerated a lot more back then. I remember a lot of PG movies or PG-13 movies mm -hmm. that had nudity. Not necessarily sex, but just like some nudity, brief nudity in it and didn't seem to mind. Now, if you show any type of nudity, you're, you're like automatically yeah. an R. Uh, but I've noticed the tolerance for violence has increased because not so much for PG, but for PG-13 movies, a lot of PG-13 movies get so close to that yeah. R rating that before, I think definitely some movies today that are PG-13 would have been R back in the day. So there seems to be less of a tolerance for nudity, more tolerance for violence. That makes sense. Yeah, I, un yeah I unfortunately. I think filmmakers have also gotten much more clever, and I'm not saying the word clever as in a way to trick and get things. I, I mean clever in doing it well, cutting around violence to, to give you the feeling of, of suspense and danger, but mm -hmm. without being gratuitous about it. Yeah. All right, uh, on to our fourth question. Corey Phillips writes, Greetings, Collider crew. Coming to you from the great white north with a question about comic book movies. It seems the further we move along, the higher the budget for these movies grow. I was wondering with the success of movies like Deadpool and Logan, both on low budgets for a comic book movie, why wouldn't Warner Brothers start doing these low-cost adaptations? They would make their money back opening weekend, no questions asked, and I would love to see a noir-style Batman movie in the Battle of Wits with the Riddler for $100 million. Do you think with the misstep of Justice League, Warner Brothers specifically will take a look into this? Thanks, guys. Yeah, uh, I, I would hope so. I also like the idea of having a smaller budget to work with and mm -hmm. being forced to be creative about certain things, but, you know, that that's just my... That's my creative preference, I guess you could call it. But this question brought me back to when we were discussing that Forbes report mm -hmm. about how much money Justice League will lose for the studio. And it came with a really handy chart on ROIs, return on investments. And when they picked 20, it wasn't the 20 most recent, it was just 20 recent ones, but they listed out. And if you look at some of the top ones, it's like the top one on their list is Deadpool at a budget of $58 million. Return on investment for that one was 225%, which is freaking huge. Uh, number five was Logan with a 90% return. Then you get all the way down to the bottom of the list, and that's where we find some DCEU movies, the bottom one being number 20 on this list, Justice League, which cost a reported $300 million to make and a negative 13% ROI. So obviously when you spend more money on a movie, it's a bigger risk, but some it's not always a bad thing. I think sometimes spending money like that on a big movie like, you know, not necessarily Justice League in the, in the way that it didn't pan out for that movie, but with, you know, an Avengers like Age of Ultron here. Age of Ultron cost $250 million to make, 90% return. So it can work yes. out but it's a huge risk, and if it doesn't work out, that could be detrimental. Yeah, I, I personally don't think DC or WB is going to go with a lower budget model. I think, you know, you have to take into account international audiences, you know, they like the, the spectacle. I mean, Justice League, I think, is the highest grossing DC movie now ever in China. Mm -hmm. So with the international audiences, they they want to see the visual effects, the spectacle that, that you know some of their local movies don't have. Um, so I just don't see that happening, and especially with something like Justice League, where you're, you're getting know, all those characters yeah. together. You're not going to do, like, you know, it's not going to be a personal, intimate story about, like, uh, you know, them helping out, like, some like kid or something like that. Um, I just like Logan and that approach so yo, much. <laughs> so do I, I love Logan. And I, I, I think that more movies, and especially superhero movies, should be like that. I just don't think they will yeah. go that route. I would love to see what he's talking about, a, a noir style Batman movie mm -hmm. that's more based on like, you know, maybe a detective story and mystery and, you know, but I think, you know, for the trailers, they want to sell the trailers, right? So it's a little hard to sell a trailer when it's like, Batman looking for clues like in a little room versus, you know, Batman fighting a giant, you know, whatever. I guess so. So, uh, yeah, I just, would I like it? Sure. I 
don't think they're going to go that route. It's, it's hard for me to agree, but just on a personal level, just because right now my my mind and my excitement pops when I hear unique things, and most of them are character-driven elements. It's like when we were talking about all the, the new Dark Phoenix information, the things that intrigued me most were when they said, like, oh, Jessica Chastain's character, she's like she might have to assess whether or not to, to kill uh, Jean Grey as Dark yeah. Phoenix. Like, that character-driven element is much more interesting to me than any kind of, you know, even though I do like the idea of the space setting, any kind of crazy space mm -hmm. set action they'll give. There, there were so many character details in that, in that uh, piece that really piqued my interest. So mm. I, I really do think that you could have the greatest effects in the world, but those effects mean nothing if you don't back it with really strong characters. For example, like what they did in Civil War, that airport sequence, mm -hmm. it's great on an action level and it's great on a, you know, popcorn cinematic blockbuster level, but it also means that much more because Marvel has earned it with those characters. Yes, and there's a reason for why story. the characters yeah. are, are fighting. Exactly. Um, it's funny because we talk about Logan and like being this low budget movie. It's, it's still it's, 90s. It's 97 yeah. million dollars. You know, back in the day, like 100 million was I like know. the big budget movies. Even talking about Deadpool, uh, 58 million. Yeah. That's still a lot of money. But yeah, but I mean, for a superhero, that exactly. definitely is 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 low. So. Would I like to see this? I just don't see them going that route, especially when you're talking about like you have Aquaman, right? That just I think it wrapped already, but mm -hmm. like it's underwater sequences. You're not, yeah. You you can't do, you know, Flash. He's it, it's tough. It's tough. We're, we're Batman. I do see where you could actually do that. Yeah. Well, and it's also them trusting the director too. Like someone like Matt Reeves, if he kills it with the first Batman movie, maybe WB or DC will trust him mm -hmm. to. If he says, I'm going to make this lower budgeted thing and then it's going to, you know, that might be a situation where, where where they allow him to. I wouldn't mind. I just want to see them play around a little bit. It's like I love the, the big epic blockbuster as much as the next person, but it's nice to have variety. Yes, yes. All right. Now on to the last question. We have Mr. Yazban300. He writes, on yesterday's show, uh, you guys argued about rumors that come from social media and whether or not we should believe them. My question is, should we be careful on rumors that come from social media? I'm not saying that every rumor that came out are not true. It's just that sometimes I see news articles on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, accusing other people or company of bad behavior or mistreating them. And then later it gets revealed that the person was lying. He never met them or worked for them. Only he did this just because he hates the people or the company. He wants to see them ruined. Uh, Perry? Rumors from social media. Uh, yeah, rumors from social media are a serious thing that I think folks should look out for, and especially given what's going on in the industry right now and people uh, making accusations. I think this is why certain reports from certain outlets require so much vetting time and prep time. I think a lot of the reports we've been talking about recently, they're not things that were just, oh, I got a call from so-and-so, I'm going to slap it together and put it out there in the world. These are career and life ruining accusations and many of the people that I know for, that work for particular outlets that are publishing these stories, it's months if not more time worth of investigating and vetting and really getting all the details straight. But we do exist in a climate where social media can report information in a heartbeat. So I think when it's not coming from a trusted source, yeah, you should always be skeptical because that's not fair either, is that you don't want someone's reputation completely ruined because someone out mm -hmm. there just made an accusation that is completely false and not backed. So, you know, you this is very serious stuff we're always talking about now, but you do need to tread lightly, especially when working with a social media source that you don't really know. Yeah, I mean, this, you know, applies to everything. I mean, this was a big topic because of the last election and 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 political articles that were shared on, on mm -hmm. Facebook or Twitter or, or whatnot and people not verifying the authenticity of of these articles and so when it comes to something like entertainment that also is true uh, you have to go with who you trust and, and know what you know like a variety or whatnot mm -hmm. Hollywood reporter and make sure and you trust them that they're gonna get the story right versus like some Rinky Dink website that some I think that's kind of the issue nowadays and this is I'm talking about social media in general is people are now starting to believe these know nothing websites or mm -hmm. that are created maybe for a specific 
purpose and, and people aren't actually investigating. And so yes, it sucks that that you can't trust everyone, but it's kind of on the, the audience or the viewer or whoever to actually go and do the research. Yeah. Uh, I mean, people just nowadays, they just read a headline and then that's like, yeah, that's like, that's true. it becomes fact now. And sometimes you just can't help it because yeah. I, I've done that too, where you're scrolling through a, through a Twitter feed and you know, you get the ellipses or can't see the full article and you just see a headline and just really quickly in my mind before I read it, I'm like, oh, that's the thing. Yeah. But really that's not the thing. And then you read the full quote and it's just something alluding to something that might not even be fact. But you know, this applies to every single level of this industry, whether we're talking about maybe serious accusations or something like a minor, you know, bit of information about a production that could mm. completely color someone's opinion on that production before the movie even comes out that might not be true. Yeah, yeah. So definitely I would take anything you hear from social media with a grain of salt and investigate it yourself. I think that's probably the best course of action. All right, guys, that's it for this episode of Collider Mailbag. Perry, where can people find you? Twitter and Instagram at pnemeroff. You can find me on Twitter at Think Hero or Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. Don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Collider Videos for all of our wonderful videos, movie talk, mailbag, Jedi Council Heroes, plenty of other stuff. Check it out. <laughs>